Do you know Sarah? I don't know. Okay. But we now know this serial sex offender could and should have been stopped much earlier, years before, and should never have been a police officer to begin with. Sarah Everard was snatched from the streets of South London in March 2021 after cousins staged a fake arrest. The 33-year-old was then raped and murdered. But this was Cousins only four days before, indecently exposing himself to female staff at a McDonald's drive through in Kent. He was in his car and used his credit card, but still wasn't caught by police. One of several missed opportunities spanning two decades and three separate forces. The, the totality of the evidence is still something which is profoundly shocking and uh, horrifying. So in your view, could Sarah Everard's murder have been prevented? I think it is possible that it could have been prevented. The fact that he, he was a police officer, it could have been something that was removed from a much earlier stage. At the start of his career, Cousins was twice denied a position with Kent Police, first at interview, then during vetting, but was still allowed to be a volunteer constable. In 2011, he joined the Civil Nuclear Constabulary, despite the vetting force recommending he shouldn't pass because of his financial situation. In 2015, his car was linked to an allegation of indecent exposure in Kent, but police took no further action. We could and we should have done more. It's a matter of professional, personal regret that we didn't. Uh, and I apologise to the victim at the time. Despite still being linked to that allegation, he was allowed to join the Metropolitan Police in 2018. Another indecent exposure followed in 2020 that was again not properly investigated, this time by Kent Police. And in the month before Sarah Everard was killed, two separate reports of indecent exposure at the same fast food outlet in Kent. These were all major red flags missed by police, but they weren't the only warning signs. The report found Cousins had a preference for violent, extreme pornography, a history of debt and excessive spending, and it even says there's evidence he allegedly committed a very serious sexual assault against a child before his career began. It's ghastly, but it lays bare a very low base that we're starting from. And so whilst those improvements have started, we have a long way to go to build the high degree of resilience and, and, and strength to reduce to an absolute minimum the threat of anybody um, so horrific being within policing. The inquiry chair has made 16 recommendations in what is her first report of three. They include a radical overhaul of police vetting and recruitment and changes to how police respond to indecent exposure. In a statement, Sarah Everard's family said, we strongly support the recommendations that Lady Ailish has made and trust that these will be implemented forthwith. We believe that Sarah died because Cousins was a police officer. She would never have got into a stranger's car. And that is the bottom line. He was given a position of trust that he so appallingly abused and there were numerous chances for police to prevent it. Ivor Bennett, Sky News. The Home Editor, Jason Farrell, is uh, with me in the studio now. And Jason, the Prime Minister tonight calling for urgent uh, changes from the police, but mm. what can they do? Well, the Met Commissioner has promised a crusade against rogue officers, but what this report is saying is it's not enough. Without a radical overhaul that someone like Wayne Cousins could continue to lurk in plain sight. We heard from the Shadow Home Secretary, Yvette Cooper, saying that they wanted mandatory vetting standards and that they're not still, still in place. We also heard from the Home Secretary today saying that they're announcing automatic suspension of police officers charged with certain crimes. I think uh, Labour want um, people suspended for suspicion of certain crimes. Um, and what this report shows also is that Wayne Cousins was able to just, not just get away with one vetting process, but pretty much dodge things throughout his career. And so it shows the level of problems. But I think there's something else as well that comes out in this report. A lot of people came forward after Wayne Cousins' face appeared. And what it showed is that a lot of times investigations hadn't been done properly. And it's raised questions about policing itself of the general public. Uh, for example, uh, the best example is just um, a few days before Sarah Everard was murdered, Wayne Cousins exposing himself twice. Uh, they had his 
car. They had his credit card. They had his number plate. It didn't take incredible policing to track him down, and yet they failed. So there's a public confidence issue just around pe policing. That was a member of the public. But if they had actually worked it out and followed the clues, they would have discovered it was a police officer. And so a lot of this report is talking about you actually just need to have better training around things like people exposing themselves, and also better awareness of the public of, of this crime being committed. And another interesting factor as well, it's calling for more female police officers and better support for those female officers when they report a sexual complaint. OK, Jason, thank you. Too many Palestinians have died. The verdict from the United States on the day that the total number of people killed inside Gaza since October the 7th passed 30,000, according to figures published by the Hamas-run Health Ministry. The US estimates the total figure includes 25,000 women and children. But pressed by Sky News, a Biden administration spokesperson tonight could not answer how 80% civilian deaths was anything other than a failure of American leadership. Today, 104 were reported to have been killed after an incident involving Israeli forces and an aid convoy, with both sides giving radically different accounts of what happened. Our Middle East correspondent, Alistair Bunkle, reports. Order is breaking down in Gaza as people are getting increasingly desperate. This video, filmed by an Israeli drone earlier today, shows hundreds of people surrounding an aid convoy in northern Gaza. But as they did, Israeli soldiers fired on them. The health ministry in Gaza has said that more than 100 were killed and almost 300 wounded, many with bullet holes in their upper body. The Israeli military claims that some of them died in a stampede, but admitted that their soldiers had opened fire because the crowd presented a risk to them. By the time I got flour and some canned goods and took it down from the truck, they shot at us. They shot me. The driver left and ran over my leg. I lost my nerves. If you want to get us aid this way, then you might as well not bring anything. The death toll in Gaza has now passed 30,000 in under five months of fighting. Soha survived when an airstrike hit her family home one evening. Her husband, Mohammed, and baby son, Ahmed, did not. We were sitting in peace, safe, happy, talking and laughing. Then all of a sudden this happened. Nobody knows till now why this happened, whether it was justified. We haven't done anything wrong. What wrong did a six-month-old do? He was sleeping beside me. What wrong did the other six-month-old girl do? She was also killed. Most of our family were small children. Most of the children were killed. Some of them are still under the rubble. My husband, we didn't find his body. My son was pulled out, but I couldn't say goodbye to him. The Israeli military says an estimated 14,000 Hamas fighters are being killed and says that Hamas continues to use civilians as human shields, which is one reason for the high civilian death toll. The civilian cost of this war is it's tragic. It is a result of Hamas's aggression. It it's is a result of Israeli military activity as well. It's a result of Hamas's aggression. It's a result of how Hamas has systematically strategically with intent weaponize the civilian arena the civilian battlefield to try and give themselves an iron dome with the use of their people the situation on the ground is now so bad that airdrops are considered the most effective and safest ways to get supplies into parts of gaza in the torchlight they tear through cardboard boxes for any scraps of food left from the latest drop after months of war it has come to this children rooting around in the dirt to find anything they can eat. Alistair Bunkle, Sky News, in Jerusalem. Well, let's look at what uh, we can establish about what happened in that incident around the aid convoy. It was travelling north along Al Rashid Street, the main coastal road in Gaza City. Sky News has geolocated multiple pieces of footage taken at the time. The first, taken by an IDF drone, shows trucks moving north. Around 20 people appear not to be moving, although it's unclear if they're dead, wounded or sheltering. 
More IDF footage, 400 metres up the road, shows a large crowd surrounding several of the trucks. And a third, taken from the ground, shows a crowd appearing to flee as gunfire rings out. The events unfolded over a large area of around 600 metres and around 400 metres from a newly established Israeli checkpoint. The threat of nuclear war has hovered over the world since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And today, Vladimir Putin once again raised the temperature by warning of a nuclear war if NATO countries send troops into Ukraine. The Russian president was speaking in his annual State of the Nation address. Our international correspondent, Diana Magne, reports from Moscow. It was a long speech, over two hours. But Vladimir Putin kept the fighting talk for the start, tackling head-on debates in Europe over possible ground troops for Ukraine and strikes beyond Ukraine's borders. They must grasp that we also have weapons. Yes, they know this, as I've just said, capable of striking targets on their territory. He said his forces in Donbass had the initiative and would continue to press on. He warned of the dangers of nuclear war, even as he boasted of his own nuclear arsenal. And he said the US could not pick and choose when they wanted to talk. They have recently made unfounded allegations, in particular against Russia, regarding plans to deploy nuclear weapons in space. Such fake narratives, and this story is unequivocally false, are designed to involve us in negotiations on their conditions, which will only benefit the United States. But this was mostly a pre-election speech, State of the Nation style, talking up the family, the economy and the future. As the event wrapped up, a mass outpouring of mostly men, 100% Team Putin. The main message for the West is that it is necessary to build its policy, taking into account the interests of Russia, and there will be no other way. The West shouldn't be afraid. We are not going to, uh, to attack anyone, that's for sure. But uh, Russia attacked Ukraine. Uh, no, uh, Russia is defending uh, their people. And, they and talk of Alexei Navalny does not go down that well. Why shouldn't they think that Russia is a gangster state? No comment, he says. There is a perpetual sense of victimhood to Vladimir Putin's speeches. The it's not us, it's them, the West is out to get us, whilst also sabre-rattling, discussing about how a nuclear war would be catastrophic. But I think the fact that we were even invited this year as Western press, where for a long time we haven't been, speaks to his confidence at the moment. And all the while, in another corner of Moscow, preparations underway for the burial of Alexei Navalny, who will be laid to rest on Friday. The police already in situ, unclear how the day will unfold. Diana Magne, Sky News, Moscow. Well, the polls have just closed in the Rochdale by-election, one of the most divisive in recent times. Our chief political correspondent, John Craig, that joins us live from The Count. And, John, it's um, early in the evening, but what can you tell us? Anything? This has been a contentious, controversial, chaotic by-election campaign. It's all about three candidates, all of whom used to be Labour candidates. Uh, we have George Galloway, the firebrand pro-Calestine uh, Scott, uh, who uh, is now uh, leader of the uh, Workers' Party. He's been tipped to win this. Bookies have made him favourite earlier this week. He was a Labour MP for 16 years. Then there's Simon Danchuk, who used to be the uh, Labour MP for Rochdale here from uh, 2010 to 2015. He's standing for reform. And then there's Azar Ali. Well, he was the Labour candidate until he got dumped by Sir Keir Starmer, the comments he made about Israel. Although he's still at the top of the ballot paper. Azar Ali, of course, beginning with A, so that's an advantage possibly for him. Some here are saying it's too close to call, others are tipping a Galloway victory. Labour are defending a majority of just under 10,000. That was won by the late Sir Tony Lloyd, uh, who uh, died in January. Labour rushed to hold this by-election really quickly. That's how they got into a mess with Mr Ali. Nominations had closed when they dropped him. That's why he's still on the ballot paper. It's going to be a late night. It's going to be exciting. Don't go to bed. Oh, we won't be. Drink that coffee, John, thank you.
Now, all this week, Sky News has been reporting from the front line of Ecuador's fight against drugs gangs. Today, we follow the nation's Navy patrols taking to the water to help crack down on the cartels smuggling millions of dollars worth of drugs into North America. Well, back in January, the president declared a state of emergency lasting 60 days. Cartels in Ecuador control a thriving trade in narcotics and rely on access to the coast in many cities, including Esmeraldas. They use dozens of smuggling routes from Ecuador going north, and they've recently been using new routes to avoid detection. But armed marines are in pursuit. Sky's chief correspondent, Stuart Ramsey, joined the military on patrol off the coast of Esmeraldas in the third of his special reports. <laughs> Armed Marines board fishing boats off Esmeraldas on Ecuador's Pacific coast. These intercepts are constant and part of the country's crackdown on cartel and gang activity. They're looking for drugs being smuggled to North America and abnormally large quantities of fuel the smugglers need for the journey north or signs of piracy. What they're looking for is not just necessarily drugs, but it can actually be fuel as well. So some of the small fishing vessels can have um, fuel which will then be given to the fast boats that the drug users or the drug smugglers use. These are fairly random checks just to see if the paperwork's correct or not. An interceptor speedboat is launched on the move from a Coast Guard cutter as more Marines begin another Pacific Ocean patrol. This crew is looking for bigger and faster drug smuggling vessels that use these waters. We're sailing off the Galapagos Islands, its seas rich with marine life. But the drug dealers aren't interested in this place. They don't even come ashore. Rather, they seek the quieter waters to the south of the Galapagos with less maritime traffic. We join Commander Xavier Rubio's team on one of their regular patrols on the cutter Isla Isabella. His crew recently captured a smuggler boat with one and a half tons of cocaine on board with a street value of $200 million in Europe. Air Force surveillance cameras show the interceptor boat closing in on the smugglers. They maneuver into the target vessel's wake at high speed. They're using the waves as cover. The smugglers at this point don't know they're there. Then they're spotted, and the smugglers attempt to accelerate away. But the Coast Guard anticipate the move and overtake them and cut across its bow. The Marines board the vessel, arrest the crew, and uncover their illegal cargo. A lot of people have discussed and I've, I've been reading about recently is that people who are using cocaine in, in North America or using cocaine in Europe and using cocaine in the UK, which is one of the big users, have no idea that it comes from somewhere and where it comes from there are gangs, there's poverty, there's murder, there's death. People don't think about the consequences. I don't know if people think about that, but we know that is one of the biggest business in the world and um, where the money is involved, bad people is involved. South American governments like Ecuador see taking the fight to the cartels and the gangs as their own war on terror. It will cost a fortune. This country sees this war as an actual fight for its survival. Stuart Ramsey, Sky News, Ecuador. Ireland's president, Michael D. Higgins, has been taken to hospital after feeling unwell. The 82-year-old was reportedly taken to hospital in Dublin for tests as a precautionary measure. Material purporting to be the alleged evidence in the investigation into Christian Horner's behaviour towards a female colleague has been leaked to numerous media organisations and F1 team principals from an anonymous email account. The Red Bull team principal said, I won't comment on anonymous speculation. Prince William has said anti-Semitism has no place in our society on a visit to a synagogue in central London. It was the prince's first public appearance since he pulled out of a memorial service on Tuesday and followed his recent call for fighting in, Is in the Israel-Hamas war to end as soon as possible. 
The two likely candidates for the US presidency are today making competing visits to the Texas border with Mexico as immigration threatens to become one of the defining themes of the upcoming campaign. Mr Biden's favorability ratings on the issue have plunged in the past year. So could it cost him the White House? Our US correspondent Martha Kellner reports. It's the potent political issue of 2024, and these the people in the crosshairs. Migrants stuck for the moment in no man's land, at the wall which separates Mexico and the United States. With border crossings at record highs, the president knows it's a serious vulnerability for his re-election campaign. Folks, it's real simple. It's time to act. It's long past time to act. And for his likely contender, a major opportunity both men making dueling visits to the southern border. The United States is being overrun by the Biden migrant crime. It's a new form of uh, vicious violation to our country. Our country and this All is where Donald Trump's, Trump's rhetoric is reverberating. Nothing is more important to voters in the entirety of the, of the U.S. because we've basically made our country into a sanctuary <laughs> country. This group of veterans in San Diego are driving in convoy to the border wall. Derek is a former Marine turned estate agent. It just takes one. It takes one to cause, you know, another 9-11 or an October 7th in, in Israel. You know, my wife travels with four kids. She doesn't have the training that I do that goes around and, you know, is, is aware all the time. Yeah, she, yeah. she just doesn't. <clears throat> so, yeah, it, it definitely worries me. Donald Trump talks about um, immigrants poisoning the blood of America. What do you make of that sort of language? Illegal immigrants. I don't want here that are going to people that are going to come over and just suck the system dry. Where the wall ends, the group have laid razor wire in a bid to thwart what they say is an illegal invasion. What happens to someone if they get caught on this? Dangerous? They get injured. <laughs> it hurts. We tried to make it painful enough upon arrival that they would just find right. another way. For those who do make it through, this is what their first few hours in the US looks like. Waiting on a pavement in central San Diego is Maria from Ecuador. She says she's fleeing gang violence. The situation in Ecuador, it's ugly, it's dangerous. We came over here for a better future, to support our family and to stay for a while. Many wear tracking devices on their ankles to monitor them while their asylum claims are processed. Immigration isn't just a flashpoint in border cities. These migrants are heading to the airport and destinations across the US. Laurie and Tom from Denver, Colorado, say the system in their city can't cope. We can only handle so many people. Mm -hmm. We only have the resources for so many and allow people just to keep coming in and coming in. Mm -hmm. Something's going to break. You think Donald Trump would protect the border better than the Biden administration currently is? I think anybody would protect the border better than the <laughs> Biden administration, regardless of who that is, truthfully. It seems like this in downtowns across America that feed fears about immigration. President Biden knows he has to turn this issue to his advantage if he's going to prevail over Donald Trump. Martha Kellner, Sky News at the US-Mexico border. Today, the Home Office published 13 reports by its sacked border watchdog after months of delays. Throughout the newly published reports, David Neal highlighted major failings in government policy and said that Home Office data was inexcusably awful. Gurpreet Narwan reports. It's asking because obviously some of these are going back to... Serving up year, uncomfortable truths. The government's former border chief, David Neal, who was sacked after leaking internal information to the press. And you know, I've been sacked for uh, doing my job. Um, I think I've been sacked for um, doing what the law asks of me. He says the government has been sitting on his reports. Now 13 of the 15 have been published and they paint a damning picture of a chaotic and dysfunctional department. It raised serious safeguarding concerns around DBS checks at hotels where children were being housed. It also said the protection of the border was neither effective nor efficient. And they said only two people had been removed from the UK under strengthened rules that disqualify people from asylum if they've passed through a safe country. 
The context to all of this is interesting. Some say that the delay in publishing these reports hint at a government that is attempting to avoid scrutiny on the very policies it's trying to win voters over on in the upcoming general election. These reports describe a clear disconnect between policymakers in Whitehall and staff on the ground in airports, migrant centres and asylum processing offices. The Home Office downplayed suggestions that it deliberately suppressed the information, claiming that it was going through the appropriate due diligence. But opposition politicians were sceptical. I think they're trying to hide things. I think they've been trying to sit on these reports for very many months and now just suddenly release them. Serious problems and chaotic problems in the way that Conservative Home Office has been run after 14 years of the Conservatives in power. I just think it's not good enough. Whether deliberately suppressed or not, these reports were published in a data dump late on a Thursday afternoon. A recognition, perhaps, that these reports are hardly flattering for the government. Gurpreet Nawan, Sky News. TV chef Dave Myers, best known as one half of the motorcycle riding cooking duo, the Hairy Bikers, has died at the age of 66. Announcing his death, his co-star, Cy King, said, my best friend is on a journey that for now I can't follow. Our arts and entertainment correspondent Katie Spencer looks back at his life. And there's the ladies who make this all possible. Merry Christmas, girls. His northern wit was a delight to watch. If this was oil, that would be Texas. Dave Myers, the bespectacled half of the Hairy Bikers duo, was a regular on British television for over two decades. Their friendship extended to the many who tuned in to watch the pair travel, laugh and cook together bonded through their love of food. I keep giving all these memories of all the, the things, because we were mates for 10 years before the bikers. Yeah. And those 10 years, all the mad adventures we had, the mad <laughs> ideas, it keeps flooding back to me. <laughs> you know, essentially, I haven't changed. With two gadgets sitting on a bench. Myers was born in Barron, Furness, Lancashire. The pair met in 1995. Both worked in TV production, Myers as a makeup artist specialising in prosthetics, Cy King as a location manager. After moving to front of camera and finding fame through their cooking show, the pair published numerous books, selling in excess of six million copies. Years of eating gorgeous food have taken a toll. Even launching their own diet club, admitting they had a wake-up call after a doctor told them they were both middle-aged and morbidly obese. Their relatability, part of the appeal. <laughs> In 2013, Myers quickly became a fan favourite on Strictly Come Dancing. I don't care, Dave, what they say, you're my favourite. Yeah! What he lacked in skills, he made up for with enthusiasm. More recently, on their cooking show, he'd spoken openly of his cancer diagnosis less than two years ago. When I was told I was ill, I never thought I'd ride a motorcycle again. There's a spirit of Dave that I've always loved. Although chemotherapy had left him too unsteady at first to get on his beloved motorbike, he'd managed to return to filming towards the end of last year, travelling from Scotland to Devon in the latest BBC Two series currently on air. Theirs was a show free of the arrogance or ego of the professional TV chef. People kept watching because of the pair's enthusiasm for eating. The warmth and wit of Dave Myers, an essential ingredient in making the Hairy Bikers an enduring success. Katie Spencer, Sky News. Dave Myers, who's died at the age of uh, 66. That was Sky News at 10. Coming up, we'll take a first look at tomorrow's newspapers in the press preview. Tonight, we're joined by the Daily Express columnist and broadcaster, Carol Malone, and the political editor of the Liverpool Echo, Liam Thorpe. And amongst the stories we'll be discussing, this on the front of the Financial Times. It's headline, Putin menaces West with warnings of nuclear risk in war over Ukraine. Do stay with us. We'll be right back.
Welcome back. You're watching Sky News. In just a moment, the press preview. A first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive. But first, our top stories. The inquiry into Wayne Cousins has found that three separate police forces could and should have stopped Sarah Everard's killer from ever becoming a police officer. At least 100 people have reportedly been killed as they surrounded an aid convoy in Gaza. And President Putin has warned of a risk of nuclear war if NATO countries send troops into Ukraine. Well, it's time to see what's making the headlines with the Daily Express columnist and broadcaster, Carol Malone, and the political editor of the Liverpool Echo, Liam Thorpe. They'll be with us from now until just before midnight. So let's see what's on some of those uh, front pages for you now. Well, nothing to stop another police killer like Cousins. The Times leads with the release of the inquiry into the murder of Sarah Everard that's recommended an overhaul in policing. Russian President Vladimir Putin's threat to use nuclear weapons over the West's support for Ukraine is on the front of the Financial Times. Meanwhile, the Telegraph suggests Russia is deliberately flooding Europe with migrants to destabilise the continent. The Guardian's front page has reports that more than 100 Palestinians were killed in an incident involving Israeli forces and an aid convoy, with both sides giving different accounts of what happened. The Eye has a story about next week's budget, reporting a 2% tax cut is now in doubt due to bad economic forecasts. The Daily Express carries a warning from the former Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, that current immigration levels cannot go on or Britain will become unrecognisable. Britain's broken borders is the Daily Mail's headline on the just-published Home Office reports into immigration. The Metro dedicates its front page to the hairy biker star Dave Myers, who's died at the age of 66. As does the Daily Star with the tribute, my best friend is on a journey that for now I can't follow. And a reminder that by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's newspapers while you watch us. And we are joined tonight by Carol Malone and Liam Thorpe. Welcome again to both of you. Let's start with the case of uh, Wayne Cousins. The report has um, been uh, published now and the chairwoman, well, this is a quote on the front page, nothing to stop another police killer like Cousins. Extremely depressing, Liam. Incredibly depressing, incredibly shocking, incredibly scary, I think, uh, those words from Lady... Angelini, you know, the number of failures across three different police forces to stop this man uh, from, from being allowed to become a police officer at all and, and do the, the heinous crimes that we saw him do is staggering, to be honest. And, and when you, you look through the report at the, the, the number of red flags, the number of warning signs that were there, you know, the, I mean, I'd say I'd go far beyond red flags. You know, he's been reported to police eight times mm. for indecent exposure. How on earth does that not stop you being a, a police officer and, and become recognised for the criminal that you are? You know, this isn't just about a criminal who was, you know, getting away with it. This is about a criminal who was getting away with it and then became a police officer. He had a gun, he had handcuffs, and we know from the harrowing details of the Sarah Everard case that he used that position as a police officer to, to, to do what he did, which is, one, you know, amongst the most horrific crimes we've, we've ever heard. It's, it's a, a grotesque failure across policing in general, and I think it's going to take a long, long time and an enormous amount of change for people to regain that trust in the police. And, and as Lady Angelini says, you know, this, is, this needs to be done now. It, this, this can't be kind of moving, moving at the kind of pace that it is now. I saw a a member of the Great London Authority speaking before, saying she still doesn't think that the police quite get the scale of this, the scale of change that's needed, the pace of change that's needed, um, and it needs to be wholesale reform if people are ever going to trust in their police again. And Carol, the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak saying this evening that the police absolutely do need to regain the trust of the public. Mm, absolutely. Um... I think it's going to take a long time before that happens. But what struck me today was um, Sarah's mum uh, making the statement today. It's very rare that she has said anything since the murder of her daughter. I'm not entirely sure she has. Uh, but 
I, I was thinking about her today, watching her, and, and she said, she said, my daughter would still be alive if he hadn't been a cop because she would never have got into a stranger's mm. car. But, but I, I think, the, the, you know, it's bad enough having your child murdered. It, it's, all, it's impossible to get over, but, but what is entirely impossible to come to terms with it, she could still be alive if there hadn't been these catastrophic failures to stop him. And, and I think I would say now that, you know, having you know, read stuff from this report, that a lot of the people who allowed him to get away, that I want to know if they're still in the police force. This guy's nickname was the rapist, for God's sake. You know, and, and he had lots of colleagues. You know, I, I have a lot of time. I think the cops get a hard time on lots of stuff, and a lot of them work very hard, and a lot of them are very good and decent. However, the ones that knew this was happening, and that stood by and did nothing when they knew he was the one exposing the others. They saw uh, he was part of a WhatsApp group, for goodness sake, that was sending porn to they were sending porn to each other. They heard the way he spoke about women. What kind of coppers are they if they are still in position? They shouldn't be. They should be rooted out because they are part of the problem. They are what the, uh, Lady Eilish is talking about. They are. But do you they, think that? that that's indicative of, of a culture yes, or they just absolutely. some bad apples? Uh, no, no, I think that's indicative of a culture. You know, he was in three separate police forces, people who witnessed this kind of behaviour from him and no one did anything. You know, there were police forces who, it, it was flagged up that he had exposed himself somewhere and the, the car reg matched his. They dismissed it without ever even talking to him. In the him, days before the, yeah. the murder yeah. They, they never days even before. spoke yeah. to him. So Sarah Everard would still be alive today if some of his colleagues had spoken up and had this guy chucked off the force. But there seems to me to have been a reluctance on the part, not just of his colleagues, but of bosses in these police forces who knew about his reputation and still they did nothing. I think uh, Lady Irish described some of the investigations as uh, lethargic, inadequate and inadequate. I'd go much farther than that. They weren't just inadequate. They were entirely incompetent and cruel, you know. It, it, it's being careless with women's lives. You know, how little do you think of women when you can hear a guy like this talk about them in the way he did in the police station? And so bad were, were his crimes. They nicknamed him the racist, rapist, his own colleagues. Liam, so, also on the, the front page of, sure. of, of The Guardian and also that... Uh, assertion that he should never have been a, a policeman no. in the first place. No, and, and as Carol says, you know, I think Sarah's family are, are right in what they say, that, that if he hadn't been a police officer, this would not have happened. I think what you say as well, Gillian, about the, the, the wider cultural issues, you know, this is just one of the reports from this inquiry. There's going to be two more. One is going to look at wider cultural issues. One is going to look at the case of David Carrick, which is another absolutely oh. hideous case. We also see up in Scotland, of course, there's a, an investigation going on into failures that have happened there. It, it's, it's a widespread thing. I don't think we can kind of use this few bad apples and line the, anymore. Okay, it's, it's, it's a cultural but, issue and the, that needs But the to problem change. is this reflects on all the good cops as well, and that's, that's what, that is what I think is the shame here. You know, I know for a fact now, if I get stopped by a male police car for anything, I will not get into the car. He's going to have to drag me in by the hair because I will not do it now. And I think I'm probably one of millions of women who will be there. We won't do it. And that means that we have lost trust. And, and you know, yeah. uh, Lady Alice talks about building that trust back up. Yeah. When's and that that, that is the, the trust that uh, yeah. Rishi Sunak also needs, uh, says yes. needs to be uh, reclaimed. Um, let's move on to the Financial Times and this warning, um, stark warning from... Putin, Vladimir Putin, to uh, NATO countries. Lynn. Yes, uh, well, Vladimir Putin has been making a sort of state of the nation, extremely long, laborious address, as he, as he likes to do. Of course, there's a, an election coming up soon, not that there's any sort of legitimacy to, to that, um, and, and obviously he will, he will win by an enormous amount. He's been a little bit um, jostled by some comments by uh, the French president, Emmanuel Macron, who mentioned in is sort of in passing the idea of 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 sort of nato troops mm. supporting the the mission the defense of ukraine on the ground now i should say this was quickly sort of rebutted by the uk by the us by germany who i think were quite nervous about it but it, nonetheless it's 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 ruffled the feathers of putin who has as he often does has come out with these kind of threats about uh nuclear attacks and then he's saying that his he could attack western targets um it, it comes at a difficult time in the Baltic region as well because the Baltic leaders are sort of calling for more shows of strength in the NATO countries because of the military operations gathering on, on their borders. So, it obviously, massively increased 
uh, tensions in the region. You've, you've got the situation with Sweden and, and Finland joining NATO as well. So it's, it's no longer just about Ukraine. Putin is looking at his other borders and where he sees his threats coming from. Obviously, a lot of this is, is, all, is, is, is rhetoric. He wants to kind of keep the Russian people on side because this, of course, if you remember, he was confident that he could, this special military operation that we would yeah, we... refer to as a, as, a, as a horrific invasion, that, yeah, he would have taken Kiev in a matter of days. It's been two years. Yeah. It's gruelling. It's going on. And he wants to keep... The, the Russian people on side, so he has to sort of show this kind of macho strength. But obviously, it's it's it's, it's still pretty scary stuff to, to hear him say, even if we take we can take it for the sort of threats no, that indeed. it is. And we remember that in, in the beginning, he well wasn't referring to it as a, a war at all, and everybody was banned it still from doesn't, referring a special to military operation. Yes. But we all know yes. what exactly what it is. Uh, just because of time, Cara, let's move on to the yeah. Express. 1.4 million granted uh, UK visas last year. Suella Braverman is uh, commenting on this. She's not uh, at all happy. No, she's not. And I mean, no, she's <laughs> she's she's trying to destabilise Rishi, and, and this is the perfect um, area and subject on which to do it. Um, she's saying, you know, but in, in, in many ways, what she says is has some credence because you know I think last year it was seven hundred thousand people uh, we granted visas to from from everywhere, and we can't keep doing it at that rate. And because it's not just the people who come who come to work here or come to study here, um, they bring their families too. So the numbers are, are rocketing, and and we can't you know we have a we have a sh we have a massive housing shortage in this country currently, um, and and this is costing. A it's just costing a fortune. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and, and Suella's not going to let up, you know, everything that she was was saying would come to pass when she was Home Secretary, she's not going to let that go. And, you know, the closer the election comes, the more she's going to ram this home to people. Mm. Because she wants people to think, you know, if I'd been there, this wouldn't be happening, which is not necessarily the case. I would but, put out that she was the Home Secretary as well. You know, this was her, in her purview and... She never really got a handle well, on that. Uh, point I mean, point well fair. made. We're going to have to leave it there because <laughs> we, are, we are running out of time. Um, we shall continue <laughs> discussions after the break. Uh, coming up, obesity is now a greater threat to global health than hunger. That's in The Telegraph. We'll be discussing that next. Just stay with us. When I hit that water, I felt so victorious. I have had times in lessons where I've been struggling to walk, I've not been feeling well, and in the water, it all fades away and I'm just a different person. And learning to swim has been so freeing. I have sickle cell disease and I can swim. For me, it was kind of, as a filmmaker, I wanted to look at things that were from my community that I could attempt to address, mm. and I think, when I came across that statistic, it was so shocking that I almost didn't believe it. And I thought, let me see if I can try and attempt to solve it mm. in 12 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Which I feel like we did. Yeah. <laughs> well, you take three black non-swimmers, all with differing barriers of entry, and you talk about the statistics, and they are shocking. Sport England say 87% of black adults uh, don't swim and 86% of black children don't swim. Each one of them had their own individual story as, as to why they hadn't learnt to swim already. Um, we, we had one guy who had really long uh, dreadlocks, mm -hmm. so his hair was always a barrier and he couldn't find a, a hat to fit his head. Yes, yeah, the practical you know, issues to, as well, isn't it? The practical issues yeah. around getting in the water. Um, and, and with the others, health issues and, uh, you know, uh, cultural issues as well mm -hmm. around parents who don't bring, you know, who, who didn't bring their children to the pool when they were younger or told them to stay away from water. So between the three of them, they all had individual issues that were, were all quite related to, to um, you know, their upbringing and who they were as a person. I think... When it comes to swimming, I, I wanted to prove that, you know, black people are not, not swimming because they're lazy. There's a mm. lot of barriers of entry when it comes to learning to swim that they can now overcome. And I think the common myth is that the bone density of black people is significantly heavier um, than white people. Mm. And that is true. However, mm. the, dis you know, the difference between them is so minuscule that it wouldn't actually impact mm. your ability to float. Yeah. So what a lot of black people say is, my bones are heavy, 
I'm going to drown, there's no point. Let's look at all of these things that over the years we've just used as excuses mm. and see if we can tackle them one by one and overcome something and, you know, really make it a space where black people feel welcomed and safe and, you know, as people get older with, you know, arthritis and that kind of thing, mm. that black people can swim. Uh, just want to bring you some uh, breaking news, and that is on uh, President Michael D. Higgins. We were previously reporting that he'd been taken to hospital as a precautionary measure, um, having felt unwell. The update is that he will remain in hospital overnight. He is in excellent spirits, uh, we're told, and has thanked the medical staff for the care that he's received. So no immediate concerns have been identified, but the decision was taken that uh, in order to undergo some further tests, uh, he will uh, stay in hospital, but is in excellent spirits. We'll, of course, keep you updated on that story as, uh, as soon as we get any further information. You are watching the press preview. Still with me, Carol Malone and Liam Thorpe. Uh, going to take a look in this section. Um, quite a surprising story. Front page of the Daily Telegraph. Obesity has overtaken hunger as the biggest threat to global health. Carol? Yeah, I mean, quite astonishing, really. Um, it's and, and the UK on that list, we are number 78 on that list out of 200 countries in the world the, the, in terms of obesity. Mm. Um, but it's interesting because they're saying that, you know, both obesity and... Um, uh, and, and you know being being thin are you know ban they're both forms of malnutrition so being too thin is a form of malnutrition being too fat is a form of malnutrition because in both cases you're not eating what you should be eating so you're not getting nourishment or the vitamins um, so, and it's, it's saying the children are and it's interesting that this this has been um, a study being co uh, co by a global team led by uh, people at Imperial College here and it's saying the children are paying the price. Um, for our inaction on obesity. Um, under 18s, um, globally, 159 million of them are obese. Um, so it's incredible, isn't it, that, you know, this is to do with, you know, we, we live now compared to, I don't know, 50 years ago in a land of plenty, and we live in a... a, in a uh, we live in a time when there's you know, junk food probably overtakes the consumption, um, junk or processed overtakes the consumption of good food for, for many people for all sorts of reasons, a lot of them being financial. Um, but another interesting fact is that, that um, the number of um, women who are obese has doubled since 1990, just 1990. That's, it's incredible. But it's the children that worry me more than anything because they're not the ones who are in control of their own weight. Mm. Um, they don't go out and do the shopping. They're not the ones who feed themselves. Their parents feed them. And that, that I think, is worrying that, you know, we're going to get to a situation where kids are dying before their parents because of obesity-related diseases. And I think part of the problem in this country, we're, we are frightened to talk about obesity now. We're frightened to talk about it to the people who are obese in case it upsets them. Well, you know, compare upsetting them than with them getting, you know, diseases like heart disease, like lung disease, like diabetes, all the things. You know, we've got to, we've got to be... We've got to be prepared to tell people truths about what obesity means and what it means for your life. Uh, and in this article, the Director General of the World Health Organisation is uh, calling on the food industry to play their part 
to uh, tackle the obesity crisis. Well, people Liam, have to too. Liam, take us into the Metro um, and the passing of Dave Myers at the age of 66, oh. the hairy biker. Really, really sad. Yes, Dave Myers, one, one half of, of the very famous and, and, and much-loved duo, the hairy bikers, um, who I think sort of define that kind of heartwarming mm. type of television, that really comforting TV, you know, and, and I think also a real... Um, healthy depiction of male friendship as well just mm. you know two guys who clearly were loved being in each other's company um and kind of won the hearts of, of the nation through their their cooking through their travels through their camaraderie um we'd actually in, in uh, sort of interestingly in the last few days we uh, the liverpool echo been doing a bit of reporting on um the hairy bikers because in their uh, most recent tv show they visited liverpool and went to a number of scouse institutions for uh, for various different um delights and everyone who met them said how lovely they were, just how, how wonderful it was to have them yeah, there. That and really then came across suddenly we were, you know, today, then we just suddenly hit with this news. Yeah. And I think it was, I know obviously he'd been, he'd been unwell, but I still think it was quite a big shock for people. And, yeah. and you see the, the quote from Sai there, and it's, it's just really beautiful. Isn't yes, it? my best friend's on a journey that for now I can't follow. Yeah, I must leave it there. Thank you both. We'll see you in the next hour. Okay. Let's take a look at the weather for you now. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, to fly. sponsored by Qatar Airways. Friday marks the start of the meteorological springtime, but uh, heavy rain will keep the flood risk, while snow will affect some hills. Northern and eastern Britain will begin mainly dry, with patches of frost and fog. Elsewhere, there'll be some rain, sleet and hill snow, but the far southwest will be more showery. That wintry mix will move north and east across England and Wales during the morning, with heavy showers following. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. <laughs>